Susan Wilden, the CEO of Airbnb Australia. Welcome to Chew the Fat. I started in country Queensland in a tiny country town of 160 people. You didn't have a TV, you didn't have internet. Groceries came on train once a month. If you wanted it, you had to make it. If it broke, you had to fix it. I say yes to things that I think I can't do. I don't think I've started a single job where I haven't thought, I won't make it through probation. They'll work out, I can't do this. Then you get in and you realise, actually, I, I can do this. Is this aviation business with Richard Branson? We just brushed past that so quickly. <laughs> Explain. So I just spent eight hours waiting in the foyer until he walked past and then said, I've got this idea. Her husband had passed away. She couldn't afford to stay in her home uh, on the pension. She started renting out her spare room on Airbnb so can now stay there. But she said something that's always struck with me and she said, I can no longer go and see the world, but now the world comes to see me. What is that coaching advice that you give to those younger females who are you know, starting a business or starting their journey? Susan Wilden, the CEO of Airbnb Australia. Welcome to Chew the Fat. Thank you, thanks for having me. Today you've challenged me with a beef wellington. As you know, I was incredibly nervous upon your entry <laughs> uh, to make sure it's cooked to perfection, and I think we did all right. Shall I try? Take a bite. It looks incredible. If I was a master chef judge, I would say presentation <laughs> is perfect. <laughs> Oh, this is always a this is always an anxiety <laughs> moment for me and me and Kai. Have you eaten one before? I have, I have. Okay. I've just never cooked it, but I'm hoping the flavour is okay. Mm-mm. Mm? That is perfect. Perfect. So where I'd love to start today, Susan, is what is the single biggest challenge that you've had to face as the CEO of one of the largest and most impressive tech giants of our generation here in Australia? Mm. It's an interesting question. It actually is how you change people's mindsets. So everyone loves Airbnb to go on holidays. Easy for, for, for that to happen. What's really challenging is to get people to consider listing their homes. And it's such a long consideration journey because it's so private and personal to you. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably the biggest challenge is we have so much demand um, for people who are wanting to, to holiday in all parts across Australia and, and New Zealand. Um, but it's getting people to think about opening up their homes that is probably the toughest part of it. And ironically enough, the second they host the first time, they absolutely love it and you know, love the connection, love meeting people and of course love the financial benefits. Uh, but that's the, that's the thing that's probably um, toughest to shift. Okay, and how do you shift that? A lot of it is education. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's partly through our, our host clubs and our ambassadors uh, who then will talk to their friends, their family. And that's where a lot of people start is, oh, my neighbor was doing it and they told me how easy it was and they love it and it paid for their holiday or it paid for their renovation. And, and then that's kind of where the flywheel starts. Mm -hmm. But it does take uh, a lot of time. Yes. Um, and it's not something that you can just do, uh, you know, a, a high level TV ad to, to cover it off. Makes sense. Now, I, I would love to know the context and your journey. So take me back to your childhood. Like, how did you get to, to the position that you are today as a CEO of such an impressive company in Australia? It's a great question. I started in country Queensland in a tiny country town of 160 people. Wow. Um, and that's if you draw a pretty big circle <laughs> around the town. And we weren't, in fact, in town. Um, and I think when I, when I look back at my journey, uh, from there moved into Toowoomba, which is a, a, mm -hmm. a larger but still a, a, a country town, then to Brisbane, then to London, and then back to Sydney. Uh, but actually, I think a lot of where I've landed has come from those really country mm. routes, which is you didn't have a TV, you didn't have internet, uh, groceries came on train once a month. If you wanted it, you had to make it. If it broke, you had to fix it. And you only had the resources that you had on the farm and you only had each other. And so I think there's a real resilience that comes from that about just an innate belief that was never spoken about, but you just had throughout your childhood of, you can do that, off you go. Um, and it's a standard farm thing. So if you're driving a car at seven because someone is throwing hay off the back for the cattle, you just do things because there's no other options but to get them done. Um, and I think that has probably held me in good stead of when I've looked at roles that I've thought perhaps are too big or I don't have the expertise, um, there's always just that position of, well, let's try. And if it doesn't work out, you know, that's okay. Wow. That's, <laughs> I don't even know where to go for that. That is the coolest thing I've heard in a while. A town of 160. Now one of the, one of the rooms at Airbnb office, I'm sure has many more than that in, in a single room. So that resilience I can see is pivotal and fundamental to, to be able to do your role. 
take me through the journey of like, you know, what was the career prior to Airbnb? Mm. Definitely not anything that was linear. Okay. Uh, so for me, when I left school, uh, my children joke that my best job was McDonald's. They're very delighted <laughs> that, that when I was at school, I worked at McDonald's. Um, but I didn't have a career plan. Uh, I originally had started studying psychology. That wasn't for me. Uh, I'd enjoyed law. So then I started to work in law firms and looked at that path. But as most people know, once you actually uh, work in a law firm, it's very different from, from studying law. Mm -hmm. um, but I stayed in law for quite some time. Uh, I ended up pitching a business idea to Richard Branson um, in the aviation space. So I ended up in airlines, working there, which is how I moved to the UK. Uh, and then when I came back to Australia, I didn't want to go back into law firms. Yeah. And so I was looking at something that was a sales role just because I, I enjoy spending time with people. Uh, and so I ended up at AMP looking after uh, shopping center assets and driving revenue through mm. those, which was a super interesting, super interesting mm. role. Um, but at the time, they didn't really think that internet shopping was going to be a thing in 2009, which I was pretty sure it was <laughs> going to be a thing. Um, and so for there, I moved across to Groupon. So Groupon was e-commerce. Yes. Forbes rated as the fastest growing company ever. Um, and so my logic was, well, then I'll have bricks and mortar retail experience and I'll mix that with e-commerce and you've got the best of both worlds. Uh, from there, I was on uh, maternity leave finishing my MBA mm -hmm. and Google reached out and had a role. And I had never considered working in tech. I'd never considered, in, in my eyes, Google was for engineers. Mm -hmm. um, so I never thought that was an option. Uh, and then I originally said no to them. And then when they called again, I thought maybe I should look at this. Uh, and so I went over there, absolutely loved my time. Uh, they did four or five years at, at Google. And then uh, Airbnb found me and super interesting in terms of, I've loved travel, find someone who mm -hmm. doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, a really values-based organization, which mm -hmm. is something I think as you progress through your career becomes more important. Uh, Pre-IPO, so, so really, really interesting in that space. Uh, and one that I really genuinely thought benefited all areas of the shareholders and the stakeholders that, that it, um, it deals with. So that's where I ended up uh, where I am. My God, <laughs> there is so much to unpack. Um, and, and where I'm gonna double click and, and, and dive into is this aviation business with Richard Branson? We just, we just brushed past that so quickly. Explain. So that was, I worked at the law firm and, the, and Virgin Blue had just started mm, in Brisbane, mm. which is where I was based at the time. And the receptionist got a job at Virgin mm. and all 20 year old women working here, they're all having a great time. And frankly, she was earning more money than I was. Uh, and I've always wanted to travel and I wanted to travel overseas. Mm. And so I thought, well, I'll go and work for an airline because then I can do effectively a gap year traveling, yep. but being funded for it. Uh, I can admit I wasn't clever enough to do much research. So applied online, had the job within 24 hours. And then by the time I started, I realized it was a domestic airline. <laughs> so, <laughs> there was not a free flight to the UK. In it. And that's actually where the business idea came from was um, Virgin at the time, you can imagine hiring that cohort. Mm. They are going up against Qantas, a lot of issues on on-time performance, sick leave um, and tenure. So the average tenure was something like eight months mm. and it cost at that point I think about $30,000 to train mm. each cabin crew member up. So a huge drain on the business. Uh, and I wanted to get to the UK. So I basically, and Richard wanted the rights to fly into Sydney, which was really, he'd been trying for 11 years and hadn't been able to get Virgin Atlantic into Sydney. So I just came up with a really simple idea, which was if you could, he needed to align the two airlines. Um, and so they obviously have different ownership structures. So I thought if you could do a cabin crew exchange program, then you're taking domestic short haul, who are then trained on long haul full service airline. Mm. And people from the UK just want to come to Australia. So kind of don't have to pitch the, the, the inverse. Uh, and I knew that the CEO probably wouldn't jump on it because you know, it is a, a fairly significant investment to retrain people on, on different aircrafts and to shift them overseas. And so they used to tell you when, when you worked for the airline, they would tell you when Richard was in town and he always stayed at the crew hotel. Uh, so I just spent eight hours waiting in the foyer until he walked past and then said, <laughs> I've got this idea. And it's the only time in my life I've gone against my mother's advice if you never hop in a car with a strange man. He yeah. said, uh, we're going to go on a Harbour cruise. Would you like to come? And I was like, okay, fine. Uh, and then he said to me, I, I need the pitch um, by, by 5 a.m. When I, when I fly out tomorrow morning. Um, so made sure he'd got that. And the next day he flew me to Melbourne to meet with the CEO of Virgin Blue and said, this is, this is what we're gonna do. Um, so set that up, really complex in terms of we had to get specialist visas developed from the UK government, had to work out what happens with the superannuation. It was quite an, it was a really interesting project. Uh, but what was most important was the shift that it had. So, so, so the part of the program was you couldn't apply 
to be in the trans in the exchange program unless you'd been there for 12 months and mm. you had no sick leave and you had no lates. So fundamentally changed the performance wow. of the airline. Um, and I got to go to the UK. <laughs> so and, and I took 20 of my girlfriends from the airline with me. So yes. it was a pretty good way of experience in London. Amazing, amazing. And did you live in the UK for a bit? Five years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is, you know, okay. So a few things I'm going to have to unpack here. Susan, for the first time ever, I'm almost speechless with a guest because everything you're saying here, at first I feel in great company because the pace in which we talk <laughs> is very similar <laughs> and that is making my heart warm. Um, you said just a simple idea, just a simple idea to Richard and I sat in a waiting room for, for eight hours. Like this is, it's, this is really mind blowing to me. And I guess my question to you is, like, what, as you look at this journey and your career and what you've done so far, which is highly impressive, by the way, and I'm not here to just blow smoke. Um, what are you most proud of? I actually think it distills down to, to, to courage. So the advice I give to anyone is, I say yes to things that I think I can't do. Uh, I don't think I've started a single job where I haven't thought, I won't make it through probation, they'll work out, I can't do this. And the reality is then you get in and you realise, actually, I, I can do this. And so... The propensity to say no, because it's a bit challenging, I'm not sure, I'd mm. rather stay safe, um, I think is in all of us. Mm. And so when I look back at every career decision, even going to work for the airline, I remember the partner at the law firm looking at me like I was crazy, going, this is a top tier, you know, magic circle law firm and you're going to leave us to go and, like it doesn't make any sense. Um, and so any of those decisions I think have just been saying yes to opportunities, um, which would have been easy to say no to. Wow. That is incredible. And as you look forward into your career, yeah. what makes you most scared? I think I don't know where I'm going and there's never been a roadmap. Um, and so part of that does have some, some discomfort levels of what's the next role? You know, what would that look like? And I think my entire career has simply been something has landed that I thought that's interesting. I'll go down that path. Mm -hmm. Um, but that does come with some uncertainty of there's not a, I want to be this role in this company. Mm -hmm. It's more, let's just see what the world takes me. So, so, so in that moment, you're just kind of remaining in that moment and you're doing the best you can in the, in the role you are and, and you just, just see where we go. 100%. I love it. <laughs> I love it. And, and, and so you, you touched on there before around your children. Mm. Like coming from those country values, but now, you know, living where we live in, in Australia, like how, how do you try and distill that and, and, and bring that into, into their lives? Uh, I do take them to my brother's farm Good. quite a bit and they have started to drive cars at <laughs> seven, oh, not, not well. Um, part of that is, is just um, a lot of my family is still in, in Queensland and country Queensland, so awesome. I think spending time with them. Uh, I also think I, I don't really let them get swept up. Um, Sydney is, is, a, you know, is a wonderful place to live and there is a broad range of, of people and there are some that have more than you and there are others that, that don't. And so for them, I'm always, a couple of things we always talk about. One, I'm grateful for what I have. Mm. So we don't compare. We're just happy with, with where we are at. And I think that, that helps. Um, and two is the courage to say yes. Um, and so they'll never get in trouble for, for trying and, and, and failing. Uh, and it's really great to see. I look at even some of you know, the extracurricular activities they do. And they're so broad and varied. And there's a lot that I would say um, it's probably not going to be a career for them, uh, but it's just nice to see that they're out there um, yes. trying. So for me, I think it's also just about, um, you know, when I grew up, my mum was a stay-at-home mum, and that's what actually I thought I was going to be. Mm. Um, I was completely happy with that. That mm. was, you know, I think, love spending time with my children and absolutely adore them. Um, and, and if things had been differently, perhaps that would have been where, where I landed. So for them, I also think it's what you can see. So I hope that for... As they grow up, they realise that you know there are you can do different roles and you can do different things and you don't have to be pigeonholed into one sector or one particular title. Um, but also, you just want your kids to be happy. So wherever they land is where they land. I love that. Now let's let's shift gears. I, I want to like one of the fascinations that I have. Um, you know, we were emailing back and forth last night and, and hearing about your day. I think there's not many people that know what it looks like to be working at the calibre of a role, a position, and a job that you're doing. Let's zoom out. Like, can you share with the audience, like, what does life as a CEO of a company like mm. look like? Uh, varied and diverse. There's not really a single day, um, and that can be anything from you're in San Fran head office for, for a week, 
to next week I'm down in Jarvis Bay for our reconciliation action plan doing some on-country mm. um, activities with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. It's meeting our host community. It's getting the kids to school. <laughs> uh, you know, it's all of those things blended mm. in. Um, I'm very, very fortunate that, that I co-parent with my ex-husband who mm. we get along very well. I couldn't do it without his support. Mm. Um, so I think that makes a big difference in um, being able to share that responsibility of, of raising children. Um, but it does mean that I structure my day so that it works for me and I appreciate I'm fortunate to be able to do that. Mm. Um, you know, this morning was up at 6 a.m. getting some things done before you know the kids wake up, then it's getting them to school, um, obviously having some great time here. Uh, and then it's even things like my head of BizOps actually lives in the same suburb here, so I'll go and catch up with her afterwards because uh, the team can live and work anyway, so that will be great. Um, but it's also things like I have a completely open diary. Everyone in the company can see everything that's in my diary. The names of the... How my BizOps knew I was in her suburb. She said, I see you've got a meeting here in my life. Um, and so... Big Wellington it is, eh? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> they know. Um, and what, what that does is I have blocks where I'm picking up my children and everyone on the team knows there are certain days I can't do activities, I can't do work events, um, and there are certain days that I can. Mm. And they also know that in those meeting slots, I'm doing the school run. I'm happy to have a meeting, but mm. it can't be a meeting where I'm required to look at anything. So we can have a Zoom call, but it will be video off. So if it's just a chat, mm. you can book over that time slot. But what it says to everyone is, I'm a mum first and foremost, mm. and I have to I have to do the school run and it's important to me. Um, and so then, but they also know that then I'm back online after 7 p.m. Um, my expectations are not that anyone is working the time or the schedule that I'm working, um, just simply people are working when it suits them mm. um, and in a manner that suits them. And I think that makes a big difference in making it, making it workable, otherwise it would, be, it would be tricky. And what time do we finish most nights? Uh, in my mind, I always think it's 9.30. In reality, <laughs> it's closer to 11 or 11.30. Um, so 6 to 11, 6 a.m. to 11. Yes. How many days a week? Weekends, unless I've got um, mm -hmm. events on, mm -hmm. that is solely family time. Sacred time. Um, except for occasionally on the Sunday night, <laughs> you, do the, you do the email clear for the next week. Um, when Frank's were asking you about coming up to the fat. <laughs> <laughs> But that's again when the kids are asleep, it's a yeah. Sunday night, there's not an awful lot going yeah. on. Um, so a lot of that is, is just again working out you know, what works for me. And I think mm. um, for the last five years I've also had a, a live-in au pair and I think that has you know, been able to take... I think there is a little bit of a false narrative of, um, particularly as the female, when you do tend to do the, predominantly the, the amount of mm. housework or cooking or mm. cleaning mm. or whatever it may be. You know, I'm fortunate I've been able to outsource um, a good portion of that for a long period of time, which makes a difference. Which you, well, you two need to at the calibre of the, the, the work at the level that you're doing. I think it's, uh, I think that makes perfect sense. A, qu a question for you, what, like what, when you step into this role that you are today, is there anything you were most surprised by? Anything that you're, you didn't expect from something like this? Every company I've worked for has a vision and a mission statement. Mm -hmm. And I've worked for some extraordinary companies. What I was most surprised at was the vision and mission of Airbnb is embodied in every single person in the organisation. Mm. And there's not a single decision that is made that doesn't look across what we call the five um, stakeholder groups. And that's our hosts, it's our guests, it's our employees, it's mm. our shareholders, and it's the communities in which we operate. Mm. And so there's all these decisions that are made that um, impact Airbnb financially that are done because they're the right decisions. So that's things like, we've removed over a million people off the platform who haven't agreed to not engage in racist, sexist, homophobic um, behavior. Uh, when there was the inauguration parade um, and uh, there was a storm on, on Capitol Hill, when the uh, inauguration was happening, what Airbnb did was they said, we don't want a part of this when there was rumors that protesters were going to go through again. They canceled every Airbnb booking. They paid out every host as if the listing had happened and they refunded every guest. Um, and they did that because it was the right thing to do. Um, and so that's what I'm actually most proud of, is that whilst we don't always get it right, mm, mm. Um, certainly the ambition and the intent of everyone is to get there. And then I think the other thing that I love about the job is the, the correspondence that I get from you know, a farmer who will say, the only way we've been able to put food on the table this year is because we converted our machinery shed. Because um, as you know, farms are generally um, asset rich but mm. cash poor particularly it's very very seasonal uh, and then there's a, there's another woman over in North Sydney who her husband had passed away she couldn't afford to stay in her home uh, on the pension she started renting out her spare room on Airbnb so can now stay there 
But she said something that's always struck with me and she said, I can no longer go and see the world, but now the world comes to see me. And it was just this beautiful piece of, in a world where loneliness is an epidemic, to have these amazing connections that people are having for anyone, whether you've got a spare room, you, you can share a room to a whole house, to a luxury villa. Um, everyone is equal on Airbnb. There's someone who wants to stay in every property. And so it allows everyone to be that micro entrepreneur. And, and I think that for me is something that I've, I've really enjoyed. You know, as you said, one of the things I love, there was a literal a twinkle in your eye mm. and, and a smirk that came to it. That is a very real moment. And I can, I can feel the authenticity of like, you know, that lady's comment there, which is poetry, by the way. <laughs> um, and, and that farmer, that, that's really beautiful. And I can mm. see that that means a lot to you. Why do you think that is? It does because I just think you can work in any corporation, you can make a lot of money, you can do a lot of cost, cut, cost cutting, you can, on, on paper, you can list all the things of, you know, from an Airbnb perspective, I could list we IPO'd during a, a global health epidemic when travel was almost at a standstill and we IPO'd extraordinarily mm -hmm. um, well. I could talk about the business performance, I could talk about the growth, but the reality is, is that would happen in any organisation. Um, and so for me, it's about the people you work with, mm. given the quantum of time that you spend with them, but then also the broader impact that you have. Um, and I think that's, um, that's probably the thing that I've enjoyed most about Airbnb is going out and meeting our hosts and, and just every single one of them has a story about how it's changed their life and how they've been able to live, how they want to live and on their terms. Um, and, and that has been, um, it's just really heartwarming. And listen, we don't always get it right, but... Okay. But we certainly try, and when it lands, it's um, that's better than any P and L. Yeah, that's so cool. And and and, and you've mentioned there, we, we've talked and touched on the team, and I'd love to like, I'd love to get a sense from you, like, how do you pick the team around you? And 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 I guess like when I hear you talk, and and in, of course I've recent, recently listened to the um, the founder of Airbnb's podcast with Stephen mm. Bartlett, and it was honestly one of the best podcasts I've ever listened to. Mm. And I hear you talk and you, you embody so much of what he was saying and I can see that passion and inspiration. My question to you is, is how do you create that team and that culture around you? Like, what do you look for? So we do quite a lot of values interviews. Most tech companies mm -hmm. will do that and I think that makes a big difference. I think um, I always look for, for the ones that are a little left of center. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you, you want people who are intelligent, mm -hmm. but you also want people who have a really strong sense of common sense mm -hmm. um, so that they can see opportunity and they can kind of understand how, how I guess things will translate into the real world. Uh, and you want people that you enjoy working with. So there's plenty of intelligent people that you just think, oh, I don't really want to have to spend that much time with you. And so, that cultural fit is really important um, and, and they need to be empathetic. So it's also, there'll be times when things don't go well, there'll be times where you need people to dig deep and so it's looking for all of those things. I do tend to look for that resilience level. Mm. Um, how do you look for that? So it's everything from if someone has been made redundant, how did they deal with that? How mm. did they find their next role? Um, anyone who has done an MBA while working full time mm. or while having children, you, resilience is there. Um, so it's just being able to, as they talk through their career, understanding when are there been moments. And then you're also looking for people who can admit mistakes. Mm. And, and the purpose of that is understanding um, how they've learned and, and, and grown. And, and I guess the other way of flipping that is lack of ego. Mm. So, um, you know, ego I think is the, the fastest way of kind of killing a cohesive of a group. Mm. Um, so so there's, there's a few ways that you can kind of work that through uh, in an interview process. Um, and frankly, you, you can just, there's also sometimes you can just, you can tell connection when someone mm. walks into a room about whether or not um, they would be a broader fit. And we always make sure that uh, in any interview process, in any role that I've done, that they meet the broader team. And so not just who's their hiring manager, who's the hiring manager's manager, mm. but also who's someone on their team that can go and have a coffee with them, who's valuable, whose feedback is just as valuable of like, oh, you know, this person might be a bit tricky for, you know, mm. and so it's also about getting a more holistic view of how they would fit into the team rather than just a tops down. That's awesome. And, and, and you mentioned something there that's piqued my interest around mistakes. Mm. As you reflect on your time, what's your biggest mistake? 
The biggest career mistake was probably staying somewhere longer than I should have. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the classic examples of uh, relatively early on in my career, I would have been doing six or seven days a week until 2 a.m. Um, and outperforming uh, any of the male predecessors I'd had and just couldn't crack the ceiling. And, and I think that country value of like, mm. I'll just prove it. Like if I can just prove, you know, what I'm delivering in the role, then, then they will see. Mm. Um, and it got to a point where it was, it, it was obvious that that wasn't going to be mm. um, the case, but that probably took me longer to mm. realize um, than it should have. Uh, and I think that's also um, why I do a lot in the coaching and mentoring space, mm. because it's also about helping others to see their value um, and, and to be able to find those, those shifts and, and spots of those mistakes a little earlier. And what was the cost of that mistake? It was probably, a, well, well, one, it meant I probably did a couple of years really not enjoying, uh, enjoying the team that mm. I directly worked mm. with, perhaps not the broader um, organisation. Uh, and when you look back, it's probably just another couple of years that could have been spent somewhere else doing something that was progressing you a little bit faster or, or that you were learning, mm. learning in. Fair. Yeah. And, and this, there's, a, there's a theme that I'm hearing and I, and I, wanna, I wanna kind of explore it for our, our younger female listeners. Um, there's, there's these clear challenges that you would, you've you know, mentioned around facing, you know, being in the, uh, some of these businesses. Mm. Like, what, what is that coaching advice that you give to those younger females who are you know, starting a business or starting their career, or starting their journey? Particularly for those um, who are in, in the more corporate space rather than yeah. in the, the startup space, um, quite a lot will say, oh, there's this role, but I don't think I have enough experience or mm. I'm probably a couple of years off that. And actually I force all of them to apply because they say, you're not the decision maker. The decision maker is the person who's hiring. If you're not, if you don't throw your hat in the ring, you're not in the ring. So your only job is to apply and then someone else will make that decision for you. Um, and if you get it, great, you'll learn on the job and I have full faith that you, you will be able to do it. And if you don't, it's been a learning experience, but also it's a nice signal to the recruiter or to that company or internally that you want to progress and, and you've got that capability. Um, so I think that's probably the number one thing that I hear over and over again is mm -hmm. people just not thinking, and it's the standard stat, I think women think they have to be at 99% before they apply and men are somewhat lower than that. Um, and so it's just that standard Guilty. piece of, <laughs> yeah. but also that's great, right? Because the only way you learn is to put yourself into that uncomfortable space. Um, so partly it's that, um, the other thing is having really frank conversations mm -hmm. about, you know, if children are in your future, you know, when do you want to go hard on a career? You know, there are some places where maternity leave is going to be tricky and challenging. What do you want your, you know, everyone thinks they know what they want to look like when they come back off mat leave. Mm -hmm. Everyone assumes it will just be status quo and off yep. they'll go. It, it just isn't. Mm -hmm. um, so being able to understand, okay, am I prepared for what that shift may look like? What, what would have to change in order for me if I wanted to continue doing X or Y? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot where it's, you know, I think it's more about looking at a holistic um, person. And then the other thing which I, I always, um, so when I'm having a career conversation, it's always, what's the next role you want in the company you're in? Mm -hmm. What's the dream role that you want anywhere externally? And what's the role when you're, on the porch and you're retired that you look back and go, that's the one that I was so delighted to get. And what's really curious from that is the number of people who, you know, I had someone who worked in tech, uh, who wanted to be, wanted to work with animals and potentially wanted to be a, a vet. And it's, it's about exploring that. So we mm. looked at it and I mm. said, okay, well the median salary for a vet who's three years out is X. And obviously tech is, is relatively well paid and it wasn't anything close to equivalent. Yes. I said, so, is that viable for your mm. current situation mm. in terms of mortgage? And, and it wasn't. Mm. And so then it became, well, why don't you find some volunteer work mm. that's in that space? So you're able to oh. find and work through that through a passion, passion project. And so it's also just about, I think, being a bit more holistic rather than just aim for a job, aim for a salary, aim for a title. Mm. Um, it's more about what's the life that you want to create for yourself. Th that is really, really good advice there, Susan. And, and it's something that I think about a lot is this concept of, um, you know, filling your bucket. Mm -hmm. And some people think that, um, you know, and, and I certainly was guilty of this, was your job must fill the, your entire bucket, mm -hmm. whether it be creativity, family, friendship, salary, everything. Mm -hmm. Your advice there is, hey, this job is 
paying you very well. Mm. Um, you love doing it, you love doing it, but you also have this e extra part that you need to fill up your bucket with the animals that you're know, being around, go and volunteer. I think that's really, really sound advice. Mm. Um, and I love hearing that. That's really good. Mm. What haven't I asked you so far? Probably a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think it's been a good, I think it's been a good run of questions. Uh, I do get asked a lot about who's the, the mentor mm. or the inspiration, um, which actually I don't ever have an answer for. Mm. Um, and partly that's because I don't think there's one person who, mm -hmm. a journey is so long yes. and so varied, I don't think there's one person. Um, but I do think that along the way you find people who I would say are your cheerleaders. Yes. Um, and, and that I think has been evident throughout my career. And I've been really fortunate to have um, the whole way along um, both male and female leaders who yeah. have really pushed and, and supported me into roles, um, which I always advocate for people to do. Yes. And I think it's that classic combination of don't burn a bridge as yeah. well. So if you leave somewhere, even if you didn't like the person, you just never know where they may resurface later um, mm -hmm. and so you know that for me has always been a, a consistence of and, and something that I try and, and pay it forward in terms of um, that is why I do, I do a lot of time in, in that in I said earlier that coaching and mentoring space because I'm acutely aware that there were people who were far more senior than me who took time mm. to either advocate for me or to reference for me or to CV read or to um, you know help talk me through options and I think that's um, it's important that we can all do the same. That's awesome. And 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 the and the piece I want to actually extrapolate there is around the, the who you surround yourself with. Mm. So like who do you surround yourself with to uh, you know to keep pushing you to keep mm. expanding the way you think um, to keep you know on the trajectory you're on. Mm. Uh, that is, is genuinely I think about diversity. Mm. So there there is a. Um, people that I have a quarterly lunch with who are well into their 70s or 80s who have had extraordinary successfully businesses and I look at them and think you started and the internet didn't exist and you didn't have computers and you've had to ride this wave um, what a lesson in change management um, and resilience and then I meet with people who are 18 19 20 and their view on how they shop, how they interact, you know, what they're interested in um, is also something that's equally as valuable because much as I kid myself, I, I'm not um, that, that, that age group. And so I, I find that just having, I don't think I've ever turned down anyone for a coffee because mm. I, I feel like there's always something interesting that comes out of it. In fact, lots of interesting partnership opportunities have come out of just random um, catch-ups where there's, there's always something interesting. So for me, um, I think I'm genuinely curious about people and their journeys um, and, and I think that has always just led to these really kind of me, me learning mm. um, and also creating lots of opportunities um, on both sides. Perfect. And the last thing I want to ask you is you touched there on this concept of what's the, what's the porch job? The job that you're mm. sitting out on the porch and you're sipping that tea and maybe you're back in the country. What's Susan's sports job? Do you know what? I've already had it. So growing up in the country, yeah. um, I just wanted to travel the world. And so the ability to work for an airline, that was literally what I wanted to be when I was 10 years old. Um, and so the opportunity to do that, but then the opportunities that that afforded me. Mm. Um, and, and it was to this day, the funnest job I've ever had. It is, you're 20 or 21 years old, you're surrounded by people who are the same age, uh, you're unencumbered with uh, well, I did have a mortgage, but you're uncomfortable with children. Um, and you just, you know, to be able to travel the world and just see different cultures and to do that with your friends whilst getting paid for it. Um, to this day, I think the fact that that was a job, um, I would have done that for free. I, I absolutely loved every second of it. So I'm fortunate that I think they've had that experience. My daughter's answer would be that I worked at McDonald's because that is their <laughs> peak uh, employer of choice. <laughs> So your, your porch job is a porch job of the skies. Exactly. Susan, I really appreciate our chat today. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Frank. And 10 out of 10 for the Beef Wellington. <laughs>